as someone who is from originally from Finland, but spent most of their professional career outside, I'm so, so excited to be speaking here at Slash. I'm Juha. I spent most of my career you know, building games, building consumer apps, as a founder, operator, and also an investor. I think they might have a bit of an issue with the clicker. Oh, all right. Now we get started. But before this, actually, I was this kid. I was this 10-year-old, you know, who loved playing games, and that—that's how I grew up. So, so now, you know, this kid at that stage could never believe that you know they could be in front of stage talking about something that they truly, truly love. And I think this is like really important for, for any product that you're building, that it really comes out of your passion. Um, a bit of my own background. Um, you know, I started as an entrepreneur a little bit over 10 years ago. A company called Nonstop Games, which was acquired by, by King, the makers of Candy Crush for 100 million. Um, after that, I started a company called Donut, where we built a, a short form video platform for gamers for two years, ended up pivoting from that, and now we're building Soba. With Soba, with Soba, our dream is to enable anyone to build games. So even if you don't know how to code, even if you don't have access to a computer, you know, you can build something. And, and that's really fulfilling the dream that, you know, that 10-year-old kid had, you know, 30 years ago. Um, we're, we're super happy to be backed by some of the best investors in the, in the world, from Lightspeed to Cherry um, Point Nine. The topic of this talk is winning by design. Um, and maybe before I start, I'd love to get a show of hands. Who of you are, are building a product? Or product builders. Who of you have, you know, had wins in building a product? Who of you had had failures in building a product? So I think that's a, that sounds like a, a right ratio because I feel the longer my startup journey has been, the more I've had actually like failures and, and I've learned from them. So you know, this talk could actually could be called failing by design, and, and I think it's very important that you, know, you, you have those failures, but you learn from them. You know, that, that makes you a better product builder. I'll go through some of those lessons that I've, I've learned um, throughout my, my career as a product builder. I, I want to start, start from something that it's almost you know, embarrassingly simple or common sense to, to say. But that's something that, but I want to you know, start from that, which is building something that someone really cares about. I think Ray from Affinity was kind of touching on this as well, that a lot of us as, as product builders, we love our own products. We, we know how to pitch them. And I think it's, as a founder, I think it's great to be a good marketer. I think being a good marketer is an awesome skill. But I think you need to separate you know, your own marketing from whether you're building a product that somebody cares about. Um, and to be honest, that I, I think this is the one thing that you know, most, most products miss or how most products fail. You know, they, they end, end up building something that's you know, beautifully designed. You know, it has the right interaction patterns. You know, it gets a bunch of VC funding, has a great team. But it's a product that no one actually really cares enough about and and you know those products eventually end up dying and and that is probably the most that, that's the most difficult thing to do is to build something that is of enough value for someone i think there are two ways of you know approaching this problem um, the first one which i think is actually a pretty good one especially when you're building consumer products especially when you're a young founder is build a product for yourself. You know, if you are building something that you yourself love, it solves a problem for yourself. You know, it's quite likely that's going to solve a problem for someone else. 
And nowadays, distribution is so global. You know, you know, we have the app stores are global, the web is global. It's easy to get your product around. Marketing is a lot easier with all kind of you know ad networks and influencers and so on. So it's very likely there's going to be someone else who is like you, who is going to fall in love with the product that you love. So that's that's the first strategy. The first strategy is building for yourself. The second one, which I think like most people follow, is being really really close to the user. Um, and I'll go a bit deeper into that you know in this talk. But it's really about understanding who your user is, going deep into their needs, understanding what they want. And that's another strategy of trying to get to something that someone really cares about. Um, and obviously, like, this is super tough. I, 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 you know, before the talk, I, I, I checked some stats. And I think there's like 90,000 apps on Google Play for every month. So that's over a million per year. And, and you know, there's a lot of consumer choice over there. So I think only the, the products that you know, you know, really, you know, the user cares about, they're, they're the only ones who are, are going to survive. My second learning is and something that I've learned a few times over, so I kind of need to repeat it to myself as well, is that people don't want your product. And let me repeat it. People don't want your product. What they want is who they can become with your product. You know, they want to have this item, this flower, and get these superpowers, and that's what they want. So for me, like, I, I mean, I think a ChatGPT is an awesome product, but I don't want ChatGPT. I want an easier way to like write my LinkedIn posts, you know, without putting too much effort into it. That's what I want. Or I don't want this aura ring. I mean, it's a it's a beautiful design product. I kind of don't want it. I, I want to sleep better. Uh, I want to have like an accountability partner. So, you know, if it happens that I end up, you know, drinking a few too many drinks at a slush after party, the next morning I know that okay, maybe I shouldn't have done that, especially if I have a speech that day. Um, so people people really want these superpowers that come can come with your products, and it's easily kind of it's easy to get sort of these things mixed up. Um, so what happened to to us, for example, when we were building this you know, donut app, um, so we are building this in 2019 at the time when TikTok was growing but was still sort of focused on more of a kind of teenage female audience. So we thought it would be a great idea to build a short form video product aimed at gamers, aimed at like predominantly male audience. And you know, we got a lot of people excited about this. And I think we actually built some like really nice tools for people. People, you know, people showed interest to it. But when we po were pulling the motivation that people had for using our product, it was predominantly to become famous. And and eventually, you know, that's a really tough thing to deliver with a social network that's still like pretty small. So so for us, we sort of miss what people were really after who they want to become. Um, and that's, I think, essentially why we built a failed product. I mean, I think we, we did OK. We, we built something that's interesting, but it just didn't work because what the users wanted, uh, we couldn't deliver. So this is my, my, my second lesson. Think about what the user wants to become with your product, not your product itself. The third lesson, also something that I feel I need to kind of repeat to myself over my career building products, is that most likely your user persona, who you're building for, is too broad. So I think, I think this happens in, in a lot of startups that, you know, as founders, we love like, um, we love like a big market. You know, we both talk about the big TAM, but the user, it's, you know, that's, that's, that's a single person always. So who you have to win over is one person at a time. So if you're thinking in these big numbers, that's kind of like no one. So I think it's a, it's a lot better to be polarizing, you know, have some people hate you and some people love you than being somewhere in the middle. Like if you're in the middle, you're going to die. Um, and I think, I think what, what happens, what I've seen happen in, you know, my own companies or my own teams, what I've seen happen as an investor, I think in a lot of sort of early founder 
product teams, people have different opinions who should we build for. So there's a bunch of different people that you're talking to. You have like different you know, sort of feedback from different sources. And then you try to have some sort of a compromise. You try to be somewhere in the middle. And I think that's natural in a team to try to think of that way, to try to find a consensus. But I think it's a lot better to actually make a choice, exclude some people, and, and just build you know, for a single persona. You know, then see if that works for you. If it works, great. You can always expand. If it doesn't, move to the next one. So like, make choices. That, that's super important. In my own industry of gaming, if I think of some of the biggest, biggest companies over there, Roblox nowadays, over 60 million daily active users. Minecraft, nearly 200 million monthly active users. Actually, both of these products started with fairly niche audiences. They were not for everyone when they started. They were for like a very specific small group. And you know, they had this engaged fan base, and then they expanded from there. So a lot better starting more niche, you know, having some people that hate you, some people love you. Then you can always expand. What is helpful in, in getting to that you know, first use a persona what you want to build for is spending a lot of time and spending your time smartly with your users. Um, there's this awesome book called The Mom Test I would highly recommend for, for anyone who's building product. Um, some, some great stuff you know, around this topic. Something that you know, I've noticed myself is that really try to focus on the user behaviors, not their opinions. I think a lot of time we're asking, like, what would people like to have? And I think people like to have a lot of stuff. You know, it's really easy to say that you want something. But if you're asking someone that, have they done anything to solve the problem? Have they tried to look for a solution? How do they look for a solution? That's normally way more valuable information for, for you, when you when you're when you're building your product. So for example, for us now, you know, building Soba, our users are typically like 12 to 16 year olds. You know, they all play games. When we ask, like, would you like to build a game? Almost everyone says yes. You know, obviously, like, who wouldn't want to have their own game? But how many? But that doesn't mean that that you are likely to become a Soba user. So we normally ask, like, what are the? How have you tried to do it so far? You know, maybe they have haven't if they haven't tried any of the existing tools. And that's normally a little bit of a warning sign, because someone who has like zero, like doesn't have the motivation to try something, it's unlikely that they become an early user of an early product that still have, you know, as we want to make it as, as, as good as possible, it has you know, some glitches here and there. So I think it's really important to go deep into a users, understand their behaviors, not only ask for opinions. The fourth lesson, which I think is, especially relevant for anyone building any type of a social product is that your community, especially your early community, is really the product. So if you think of apps like Musical.ly or Clubhouse, you know, Instagram back in the day, YouTube, what most people experience is the other users who are there or the content produced by the other users. And if you're not being intentional, who are those early users, you're missing something. So there's going to be some users, and if you're not choosing who they are, you know, they're going to be, they might be something else that, that you wish them to be. Um, and I think if you choose them rightly in this social product, that can really help you grow um, the product further. But when we started, or when we first announced Soba, so this is sort of 18 months ago, you know, we had, we had some you know, investors who were, had some interest in like crypto. We had, we had some sort of, you know, us 18 months ago, we, had, we thought that maybe, hey, crypto would go, Web3 could help us in, in some way. Um, you know, then when we tweeted about our fundraise, 
actually within a couple of days, we had like 100,000 people join our wait list. And obviously for us, we were like, woohoo, this is like amazing. Like so many people are interested. This is so great. But then what we realized with that early community, and you know, we were not being intentional, that all of those people were actually joining, you know, because they want to have an NFT. You know, that was the time when NFT still had some value. They want to have a token. So, so all of these people were joining with the primary motivation of getting a financial gain. When we, when we released the product to them, a lot of people were actually not interested in trying the product at all. So what, what I realized that, you know, we were not choosing our audience. The audience just kind of like randomly chose us. Um, and, and what we, you know, had to do at the end is that we sort of had to like recycle our audience, uh, you know, move to a different direction. After that, we became a lot more intentional who we want our users. And now if you look at our, you know, current user base, you know, we have about, you know, 10,000 creators who are using Soba in early access. It's a lot more positive vibe, you know, people who are authentically interested in cre creating games who are not there for the, for, the, for the quick bug, but who are actually like super, super excited about creating something, uh, sharing those with their friends. So here are some of the ga you know, games that our, our creators are, are, are creating. Um, and obviously, this is like a totally different feel from that, you know, the first community of, of, of users that we had. My, my sixth lesson of building products is maybe a little bit counterintuitive, but don't just build what the users want. I think the users will always look at the, you know, the kind of the incumbent products out there, and they will ask for stuff that they see in them. And I think it's, 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 it's very easy to get into this mode where you're trying to close the gap between your, your product and some other you know, company or, or product that's been building for like five to 10 years. And, and normally this is just not enough. Like I, too many companies move into this mode where they want to close the gap too early. What's much, much more important for you is to focus on something, focus on the core experience of your product, making that better building something different from, from, from the rest of the competition. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm old enough, you know, I'm from Finland, so I actually started my car career at Nokia as a, you know, it used to be this big mo mobile phone manufacturer. And I remember when the iPhone came out, and you know, there was like, you know, this 2007 and 2008, uh, I believe, there's a lot of people who were listing all the possible things that the iPhone didn't have. And you know, I think we kind of look back at that now and like how silly was that, right? People didn't care about the stuff that was missing. People cared about the stuff that's in there. So I think that's, that's really important lesson for a lot of startups that you know, try to find the core in your product that gets people excited, that get, gets someone to love your product. And if you don't have that, it's not gonna change by trying to you know, close that feature gap to, to the other products out there. They may be pivot, build something different, but try to find the, the thing that people love, the thing that gives, the, the, you know, gives your users the superpowers. Think about that. So to give a bit of a summary of the lessons, I would leave you, leave you guys um, you know, with, with three, three things how to build your products better. You know, really start from this, like, you know, build something that, that people care about. Um, build something that, you know, makes someone, you know, make someone happy, make someone excited. And, and if you don't have that, you know, maybe change direction. So just try to look for that. And I think the way to, to, to find that is really like building for yourself or being close to the users. Then secondly, don't only focus on your product, really focus on what the users can become with their product. Focus what is their motivation, because 
they are trying to do something with their product. They are not interested in the product itself. And thirdly, you know, really go narrow, be close to your users. You know, don't, don't be afraid of being polarizing. Don't be afraid of being decisive. That's very important in a startup. And then what I want to leave you guys with, as this topic is about design uh, and designing products, designing products is super, 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 super difficult. There's so much competition out there. There's so many things you need to try to get things, things right. So I think if you get too attached just to the outcomes, if you're judging yourself, if you're judging your teammates just by outcomes, you know, you're making your life too tough for yourself. So I'd also advise to think about, you know, think about the, the process, actually love the process, love the grind of building products, because if you're just thinking about the successes, that's just normally too difficult. So, what I want to leave you guys with is also like thinking about designing your life in the same way as, as you think about designing your product. Th thank you so much. Uh, I really love to, to speak with you guys and uh, love to see you in the QA after. Thank you.